So I'll introduce the two speakers first. Ma Shannal is a Canadian writer, editor, and journalist who lives in Montreal and Kolkata. She was born in Cherbourg, Quebec, the daughter of two Bengali immigrants. Her work has appeared in the Bellingham Review. Some are waiting. She's waiting for them to appear also, but many have appeared already in the Bellingham Review. Hayden's Ferry Review, Malahat Review, The River Oak Review, PIF Magazine, and elsewhere. Formerly the editor-in-chief of the Montreal Review of Books, she was a frequent contributor to the Globe and Mail. Shannal re recently completed a second Master of Arts degree in English Literature at McGill University, winning a Canadian Graduate Scholarship from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council. Dr. Julie Banerjee Mehta is an author and academic with master's and PhD degrees in English and South Asian studies and holds several prestigious fellowships. She conceptualized and taught the Canadian Senator and Chancellor Emerita Vivian Poy endowed first course on Asian literatures and cultures. Her translation of Tagore's play Dark God, Post Office, was performed in Toronto, Canada by Playyard Theatre in 2010 as part of the Indo-Canadian celebrations to mark Nobel laureate Rabindranath Thakur's 150th anniversary and to celebrate the Year of India in Canada. Dr. Mehta was awarded the title of one of the 16 most influential South Asians in Canada. She is the author of Dance of Life, Mythology, History and Politics of Cambodian Culture and co-author of the best-selling biography, Strong Man of Cambodian Prime Minister Han Sen with historian Dr. Harish Mehta. She currently lives in Calcutta and teaches postgraduate English at Loreto College, Kolkata. Dr. Mehta has just completed her first novel. Julia, I'll be looking forward to reading this one. With that, over to you, Debusri, to explain how we are going about it today. Thank you, Shukrita. So the whole plan over here is that, uh, as some of you would know, we've already organized a series of webinars on indigenous studies, where we were particularly interested in looking at how identity changes in the context of a pandemic, per se. And we've also been involved at the center on indigenous, uh, with indigenous studies for a long, long time. Uh, what we are also interested in is, of course, uh, now, we decided that considering the Black Lives Matter, with respect to Dalit Lives Matter, with Every Child Matters, with Orange Day in Canada, we were also very intrigued by the idea of diasporic identity. And how does diasporic subjectivity change with respect to Canada, with respect to India, per se? We've also had a number of ongoing debates, and especially within the COVID-19 situation, where borders have become a little more malleable and also a little more determined kind of border. So we, we would like to look at the processes by which one looks at the idea of writing in the diaspora and how does one write given the context of a pandemic. So we, we, we thought of having our diasporic entities as a series of conversations. We are hoping that we will have more conversations in future, but we're very glad that we have Aparna and Julie B to initiate the first of these series of conversations on the diaspora. And as you know that we have this structured in a particular way, uh, which is we would hope to have this conversation followed by the Q and A. And of course, we would like Aparna. I mean, it would be wonderful. Aparna has kindly agreed to read some of her pieces. Uh, the, for the rest of the session, the person who would be guiding us through this session is, of course, Dr. Mehta. And uh, we are looking forward to her support as always. So over to you, Julie. Thank you very much. Julie, the unmute, please. Thank you so much, uh, Shucharita and Devushri. 
For me, it always feels like coming home every time Harish and I are honored to participate with you all at CCS. And some of the CCS students we have witnessed have made a flight right from your center to universities in North America. And Oponna and I were having this conversation a little earlier in the day that this conversation we are going to share together, Aparna and I, are really for also for the students of yours from the center who are looking westwards, perhaps to Canada, and understanding that there is more than the dream uh, to realize of the four, you know, the four-room, five-bedroom mansion and two cars, two Mercedes in the yard. More about that in a bit. Um, I am particularly enthused to be able to do this with Aporna because Aporna and I, as I found little by little in our conversation, have uh, similar shared uh, goals that we espouse and philosophies that we believe in. And our lived experience too in academia uh, is not too far behind. She and I, I found are both Canada graduate scholars. So it gives me great pleasure to begin this conversation with a very accomplished Canadian scholar, writer, journalist. She wears many hats. And I think it would be nice if we began our uh, engagement today, Oporna, uh, mm -hmm. with the idea of what uh, maybe the two theorists that uh, Professor Debushri Dottore has in her very inimitable style invoked, Igor Meva and uh, Anaid Dashtagad, who I had the pleasure to, to meet. And the idea of uh, diasporic subjectivity and cultural brokering, uh, as a writer, how do you envisage the gaps, the ellipses, the hollows in connecting the diasporic population, say diasporic Asians, and the problems of the indigenous peoples whose land really is Canada. The first slide, please. Well, as we know, would you have a first slide there, Rikida? Well, okay. Okay. Um, Maybe we can show this after Apurna's had a go at the question, right? Yeah, I think so. Would you like to stop the presentation? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Sure. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for the question. I uh, We have had uh, a little bit of time to talk about it. Um, I think that it uh, takes immigrants both first, um, uh, first, uh, section immigrants um, and second um, to uh, to grasp uh, the their uh, intimate connection to what uh, the First Nations have actually gone through um, because uh, for example I was raised uh, second um, you know, second generation, um, I'm sorry, second generation immigrant. And I was given sort of the the story, the Canadian story about um, belonging, um, about um, having the same opportunities as uh, any other Canadian might have, of having the same freedoms. Um, that was happening to me in the 70s and 80s. And even though I was living in Alberta, which is um, very close to several First Nations uh, communities that were treated brutally in the 19th century, um, Plains 
uh, Plains Indians or Plains First Nation peoples um, were in fact uh, brutally treated um, in order to um, to start to build the Canadian dream, the Canadian story um, with the transatlantic um, railroad. So I grew up in that area and I was very close to the First Nations, um, uh, the blood, um, the blood nation. And we were not taught anything about them in school. Uh, we learned nothing about them. So, you know, we lived in suburbs with large houses. We, we had um, plenty of um, things like cars and uh, those kinds of um, goods in our society. But as the, um, I would say the eighties and the nineties um, unfolded, uh, the right wing and the uh, resurgence of the right wing um, made it clear that we were not um, equal to um, white Canadians, to uh, people who, um, many of whom were invited in in the 19th century and um, without restrictions, that we were brought in um, with many restrictions. And it's that I think that for me, um, began to actually look into um, the instinctive connection between First Nations um, communities and the way they've been treated and the way my ancestors uh, were treated. Um, because there are many, many means when you're growing up as a second generation Canadian to conceal um, your own history and to conceal the history of First Nations people. So that is my perspective as a, a second generation Canadian. Um, I, I'm curious about you, uh, Julie, and how you first began to really think about the connection and the instinctive sympathy that um, many people of Indian origin have for uh, First Nations communities. Well, did it happen immediately or did you come to the country with that? that sense that there was a connection. I'm sorry, I can't hear you, Julie. That's a very good question because my first job was in Australia. I was uh, a journalist with the Canadian, with the Australian government. I'd gone there to do a PhD, but it never got done at that time. Um, and I was working for, as a journalist, for Veterans Affairs, all of 21 years, raring to go, uh, with somewhat of a, you know, feminist attitude, which I had grown up with, uh, both my parents. And I realized very quickly that this was a settler economy. I'm talking about 1982. That was quite a while ago. This was the Bob Hawke's, you know, liberal government but the inherent and intractable racism that pervaded Australia at that time, and I was in Canberra. So, you know, what I find interesting though, is that I really cannot recount a direct racist uh, attitude towards me. I had many conversations uh, with, a lot of people. And Varna, which we know in India, I think we are the one of the most racist communities in the world because we are very aware of color. Parsha me hote hobe, parsha lok hote hobe. Otherwise, you know, you're, you're not considered uh, in, in, in the realm of, of things. We all know that culturally, we, we had that problem, we still have it. So from Australia, I moved to Singapore, to Bangkok, to Singapore and then to Bangkok, where I was a journalist on the ground uh, and with Harish, uh, my partner. We went to Canada with a lot of world experience when we went to do our doctoral studies. So in that little way of Orna, maybe, uh, I wasn't totally surprised uh, by Canada. 
but to answer that that's the first part of your question the second part of your question is how did i configure this in canada when i went there you know i was extremely privileged because as i said to you earlier on in our conversations i just got lucky and i think i was in the right place at the right time i had the kind of expertise perhaps that the canadian academy was looking for and i was able to bridge uh the india southeast asia asia canadian um gaps and i was given to teach the endowed course on the first course in canada on the cultures asian cultures and literatures in canada so i was teaching michael ondat jero into mystery uh you know uh sham selvadurai and then there was people like judy fong bates and joy kogawa who went through the chinese head tax issues judy's father committed suicide because of that joy kogawa lost a lot of her family because of that they were interred so i got the full monty my class my students got the full monty i was allowed complete freedom in inviting authors and i was fascinated as to how white canada looked at the literature that was coming out of the asian canadian diaspora and was not quite making it to the canon it was still not mainstream and it still isn't margaret atwood the the kind of uh, exposure she's got the kind of popularity she's got upon and you know very well that um apart from maybe michael ondaatje none of our asian canadian writers have got that so yeah I, you know i wasn't new to it but it still struck me as there's a lot of work to be done does that answer your question aparna aparna you need to unmute yourself please i mean except because i'm muting you all otherwise there's echo so julie the when you're not speaking please mute yourself same with aparna thank you can you hear me now yeah perfect okay um I, it's interesting to me because I know that um, the sort of model immigrant, um, the model first um, first generation immigrant, um, these are people who I think um, may not, partly due to um, due to all the products that they get, all the the toys that they get in Canada. Um, and because they're they are constantly also thinking about their homes their um their home of origin um necessarily have the 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 time to um investigate uh what's happening in a nation in very close to their own city um and they're encouraged not to i think um you know the sense that you want as high a status as you can get which is something very much in our culture so the fear of associating maybe with people who um don't have that status in in your um host country which is um you know it, it is a predominantly european english french country and that is 78% um white and unfortunately i think at a certain point for many um immigrants um for first generation immigrants that at a certain point they realize they're not going to get the the ideal story um but don't maybe necessarily know that one of the solutions to isolation within a country like canada is to make alliances with the black community to make alliances with the first nations communities who are resurgent the first nations community communities are um fastest growing um population in Canada um they're the ones with enormous energy as we saw during the uh, idle no more um protests um that was a while ago but it keeps coming up again so um i guess the question is 
how is that better communicated? How is how are those alliances um, better forged um, in a country where even a liberal prime minister will reinforce the fact that it is an English French country, that those are the founding nations, even though we know everyone knows in the country that there was another founding nation. Sure, sure. So, um, you know, turning our attention uh, to more, uh, you know, groundbreaking brutalities, uh, which I think will be good for the audience to, uh, to get a visual of. Um, Modurima, I'm going to uh, bother you a little bit. If we can start on the first slide, then um, I think I have a couple of questions for Oporna, and then we will try and try and engage with that. Modurima, from slide shoot up. Okay, so um, the first. Modurima, make it full screen, please. Modurima. Uh, slide show option. Slide show. Yes, so that it will be a better view then. So basically, um, you know, the question at hand, the question at hand when you see this is, uh, you see the Chief Commissioner Marion Buller uh, and the commissioners, other commissioners there, including uh, Michelle Odette. And this was the $92 million inquiry and report on the missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. That's about 4,000 women who died uh, due to uh, police brutality, due to uh, white uh, patriarchal supremacy. And this report was shown up by uh, Justin Trudeau. Um, Modurume, shall we go to the next one, dear? The next slide. So you are, you know, you are on point, Oporna, that political expediency has stopped even someone who's a liberal and highly sensitive, compassionate, wise, young, is a renaissance man, Justin Trudeau. He's, he's the best I've seen uh, while I've been there. You know, Chrétien, or you think of Harper. At least he has a world vision. He wants to connect with the rest of the world. He wants multiculturalism to work beyond just uh, a pretty face. But even he was unable to use the word genocide, which is exactly what was perpetrated by, uh, you know, the white supremacist patriarchal uh, contingent of murderers who had a complete upper hand to do as they wished. So how would you talk specifically about gender? And I think, Opuna, we might want to just connect the issues about gender, as in the diaspora, the new immigrants who go and try so hard to set up family and home in the face of atrocities uh, within the home, you know, domestic violence, et cetera, et cetera, which, for which I was voluntarily employed to speak on the on behalf of the Bangladeshi women who were hugely uh, the victims of domestic violence, the first generation who went from Bangladesh. So how would you say that we could actually find a connection? And as writers, maybe you could say how you could talk about this common challenge faced by women of the indigenous community as well as the diasporic. Asian community. Apuna, unmute yourself, dear. Um, I think really that's that's a very interesting question because, um, for example, in the Idle No More movement, which happened in uh, 2011, um, and which was a, 
a huge um, movement that included people from all classes, um, all races. Um, it was initiated by four um, First Nations women, um, one at least who was a lawyer. These were all um, uh, very established, um, well-known people. So it was itself um, very much a um, feminist uh, movement to begin with. And you also, you remember the, the chief who went on a hunger strike um, within that. So um, it would be interesting to say, try to make, and in, in fact, it may already be happening to some extent, um, but to do it earlier, to, to make connections with um, South Asian female groups um, and within the universities also to um, make clear from the beginning that there are deep connections between um, Indigenous women and South Asian women in the way they're treated um, in the society that um, they originated in. Um, yeah, I think that would be a great idea. And by the way, this, this, um, this particular um, femicide um, of, of Indigenous women continues. Um, I, when I left uh, Montreal, there had just been a series of very large protests about uh, the death of Joy um, Ashaquan, who was a woman who uh, came into a hospital run by um, Quebec and uh, was insulted, racially insulted by nurses um, up to the point when she died. And now there is a public inquiry in her case. But the really disturbing thing was that in Quebec, the premier refused and continues, as far as I know, to refuse to admit that there is um, systemic racism, that there's racism um, among nurses and doctors, that there's, um, of course, vicious racism amongst um, the police and the police. Um, and that in spite of um, efforts to um, defund the police, in fact, in Quebec, the police are being um, funded. Um, there's a fund increases, increasing right now. Um, so yes, this is the time. This is the time for young immigrants of Indian origin um, to, to be taught that and to know that, um, that there are deep alliances that can be um, forged with Indigenous women. Debushi, may we move on? How kind of you to take over. Debushi, may we move on to the next slide with uh, the activist uh, and lawyer, Pamela Palmeta. Um, and if you, you might, some of you might remember, I think, uh, from my uh, keynote address earlier this year at your center, um, I had the opportunity to see the kind of work she was doing. And it was she who... Uh, said something which I will never forget. She said, how can we enjoy holidays and hot dogs celebrating Indigenous National Day in Canada when we haven't even considered the recommendations that have been made uh, in that national inquiry on the killings? So, uh, you know, uh, straight on point with what Aporna was saying, uh, there are many, many young, forward-looking, uh, you know, the glass ceiling cracking open, young Indigenous women or Métis or Cree women uh, who are fighting against uh, the killings of people such as young, young women such as Helen Betty Osborne, you know. Um, so if we can move on to slide four, please. Thank you, Debushri. Fantastic. You're sharing so that everybody can see everybody and the slides. So I want to bring to attention to you that uh, this genocide, which was actually a genocide, uh, 
was never really referred to or accepted to being genocide till very much late in the day. And um, one of the things which I want to again bring to um, Aparna's uh, attention is the fact that South Asian students, even in urban uh, centers such as Montreal, where, where you've studied and, and at Toronto, they do not really have much knowledge. Although we have a First Nations house, we have, uh, you know, Indigenous studies is, is very much a part of our uh, thinking and our uh, focus at the University of Toronto. This is always the backseat driver, you know, it never comes to the forefront and we need to change that. And that can only come if diasporic students will take the lead because the Anglo-Canadian, as Opona mentioned, English French nation has to transform from page to stage. It has to concern us as diasporics living in Canada, in the academy, and that is where the change, I think, will come. Opona, would you agree? Opona, uh, unmute yourself, dear. Um, yes, you. Um, I, I think that you know, for a lot of, um, I just want to make a reference again to my mother when I was growing up with my mother, that she um, instinctively ha um, affiliated herself with, even in a city full of things like um, hot dogs and, um, uh, you know, stampede every year. Um, she instinctively affiliated herself with First Nations. She would always dress up in First Nations um, clothing and um, uh, jewelry, etc. So I think it's it's very much there. It's just under the surface. And how do we create those? Um, how do we create spaces where people can connect with each other? Um, I think it's it is um, it's crucial. Um, and yes, Quebec is a huge problem. Just just to bring up your point about um, the academy in Montreal, and I'm sure elsewhere. Um, for example, I was in an English department um, over the last three years, and we did have um, a Canadian uh, professor there, but there wasn't a, a single um, book um, in his um, course um, by a an indigenous writer, which I think is is terrible. I mean, there's these all these young students coming in thinking of indigenous people as somehow separate from Canada, um, and that happens so early. So uh, where you know, I asked questions. I, I where can you find ind indigenous writers? We have some great indigenous writers. And apparently you have to actually go and take courses at um, uh, various, I mean, I can't, couldn't find it, indigenous, um, indigenous uh, center of some kind where you have to go there um, to be able to study indigenous writers. Why? I mean, this is really um, a kind of marginalization. Um, and at this you know, in this day and age for this to happen is um, disturbing. And I have to say that the same thing applies, um, sorry, just one, uh, one other point, that the same thing applies to Indian English writers. Um, they're not seen, for example, in Indian writers, Indian English writers who um, are not seen as part of the British um, British writing, uh, even if they were born or uh, did most of their writing in Britain, they're still not largely seen as British writers. So the same sort of marginalization occurs um, to people of Indian origin. Yes, it does. It does indeed. And um, as I said, apart from Michael Ondaatje, uh, there is no other text that we unpackage, unveil or deconstruct, even in the academy. Uh, as part of the English canon, because the English canon, as you say quite rightly, is very much an Anglo-Canadian institution. 
and uh, it's difficult to break into that. And unless academics such as us, and unless uh, you know people with the foresight of Senator Emerita, uh, uh, Senator Vivian Poi, uh, Chancellor of uh, University of Toronto, who gave me that free hand to get the voices from the margins into the center to mm -hmm. speak to young uh, scholars at the academy. Uh, and, and then we I actually conceptualized a course uh, which I taught for about eight years running uh, on the Asian diasporic writers and, and cultural producers in Canada. And um, Aparna, there is one surprise, which is a happy surprise I have for you, and I've kept it very close to my heart till now. And if we can move on to the next slide, please, slide number five. I'd love you to comment on this. So this is um, uh, an academic, uh, Sheila Bhattacharya. So you can see that she's a uh, Bengali father. And yes. mother was English. I don't know if you know of her. But she speaks on the Rena Verk murder. And she has, a, she has this, yeah, she has this book, uh, which I think is quite, uh, you know, seminal in this study, because it connects her as a South Asian diasporic writer to the death of, uh, you know, the, the, the murder of uh, a woman, which comes under that whole national inquiry about the brutality which ensues when uh, a bunch of Anglo-Canadian young people make the indigenous woman a target. And she actually worked on this book. Uh, I think she was impassioned, she said. Uh, she, she's a friend, uh, she's a colleague's wife. But what gives me hope, Aparna, is that more people such as her will come out and, and do the same sort of thing, you know? Um, yes, definitely. and that is fascinating. I hadn't heard about that, and that is really interesting. I would love to read that. And then we have the next slide, please, and uh, then we will leave it. Uh, so this is the Canadian filmmaker Srinivas Krishna, uh, who says exactly what you and I were talking about and what you believe in, that mm -hmm. fighting against Canadian mainstream white indifference is a commonality that why can't we see it that the Asian diasporic has that same problem, the, the complexity of belonging or not belonging? Um, as uh, Debushri's invocation of Igor uh, is, uh, I think it's situated in that that we should be we should be able to see the uh, the liminal space where we as diasporics have the same problems of acceptance as the indigenous community has. Aparna, you'll have to unmute yourself. Sorry. Um, um, I think that one thing we do need to uh, look at is, you know, um, amid all of these um, brilliant, young, strong, and very perceptive people, um, there is one sort of brutal fact, which is that we have to also ask about Canada as a whole, whether part of the marginalization of this, of this knowledge that many people have, um, whether part of the problem isn't and doesn't continue to be that as a whole, we all benefit from um, these industries and the oil patch, um, the fisheries, all of these things that have brutalized the environment and have brutalized um, First Nations peoples. When we go to Canada, when we went to Canada, when we continue to go to Canada, are we there at bottom because we benefit from those things? And how do we deal with that? How do we continue to be Canadian when, as a good friend of mine who did work at um, Fort McMurray said, is it's, you don't know what it is until you see it, until you see it, because you see the oil patch as a raping of the land and you see 
um, the brutality of it. And you know from smelling it what it does to the First Nations communities. So how do we deal with the fact that we all, I certainly, my father was an engineer in Alberta, um, how do we how do we deal with being both Canadians and yet those who who daily when we're in Canada benefit from these brutalities? How you know um, how do we choose to live? Do we live in one of those huge houses that is dangerous to the environment every day, or what what do we do? Do we do we choose not to drive? Because all of these things are, are issues that First Nations communities bring up. Yes, Saparna. Each each of those uh, issues are is complex. Each of those issues is fundamental to the way I think that new immigrants or new scholars, say from the Centre Canada, from Jadavpur University, if they went, I think nobody told me. Nobody told you. For you, it was a lived experience. For me, it was learning by watching, by listening. But honestly, the disuniting narrative that you speak about so eloquently in your article on, uh, you know, on the review that you did on the book Win "The Winter We Danced," it really struck me that the media and writers such as yourself or I would be accountable and responsible in drawing the public attention to the kind of unmitigated discrimination that is meted out to people who are really the owners of the land. And all of us, all of us are settlers. Our question is, are we all settlers? Um, because one of the things that I looked into just as part of the research for this uh, event was looking into the history of immigrant laws and immigrant uh, acts. Because um, I, some, I know we are settlers from one perspective, that we do benefit from all of these things. And we benefit from a lot of the, the um, things that have been taken away from First Nations groups. But on the other hand, um, there were restrictions to us, racial restrictions, um, until the early 60s. So what is our role in Canada? Are we really, and this is something I have had to deal, you know, grapple with for a long time. Am I just a settler, like a white settler? I mean, in the 19th century, many of them came in with no restrictions. They were given land. Um, you know, my, my father showed up in 1969, uh, seven years after, uh, you know, they first lifted the restrictions, the racial restrictions in, in Canada. Um, and that was because, as some people, for example, or Caribbean writers um, have argued, this is only because there were um, job uh, shortages there were um, employment shortages um, and that's why we're invited to Canada and sometimes I feel that way when I'm in Canada that I'm not a settler like a white settler. Point well taken. Can we have the, uh, the last slide please? So this I think struck both Aparna and I when we were talking about the Tamil Canadians uh, peacefully protesting the brutal killings in Sri Lanka. And I still remember the day was May the 13th and I was trying to get back home from university. It took me seven hours because I could not get onto the exit ramp at Spadina from downtown Toronto to go to Mississauga Oakville area. And what is interesting is that this brought the Anglo-Canadian and the South Asian Canadian students to a head. We were studying Michael Ondaatje's uh, slew of novels. It was a one-year course. And the last word on the first day of class 
after the 13th of May from a white Anglo-Canadian boy to my Sri Lankan students in the class was, why don't you leave your baggage back home? And I was just gobsmacked. I could not believe that in the academy in Toronto, at the University of Toronto, you would have this kind of alterity. Apurna, what would you say? Yeah, I, I don't. I don't know where that that um, determined refusal of acknowledgement of of um, of terror and and um, need comes from. I, because it's obvious people don't all do this for no reason. They don't just all gather in large masses in the streets and block um, cars because they're it's fun for them. They, they do it because they're in desperation. They're worried about their families. But when I see something like that, and when I think about it, I, I you know, I, I think about what happened in Canada to um, the Jews after, um, you know, in uh, before uh, the Second World War, that we, we wouldn't let them into Canada. Um, they, they were facing genocide and we didn't let them in the country. Um, these people were also uh, facing genocide. And um, we continually do this over and over and over again. We do this. Why? Why? Why do we do this in one of the richest countries in the world? Psychologically, where does it come from? I think it comes from a place where if you look inwardly, if you look at India, and this is you know, this is something we avoid speaking about, mm -hmm. Aparna. So I would love your views on it. And you can cut in at any time. What about our approach to the question of letting in immigrants? That's a hard one. How do we treat our indigenous people? That's an even harder one. How do we treat our Dalits? And these questions are questions that I faced in the Canadian Academy that you talk about our othering, and this was told to me by a, a, a Caribbean, uh, a young Caribbean gentleman in my class. And he said, you talk about the discrimination, but you do the same in your country. And his doctoral dissertation eventually became Dalit literature. So he was, you know, he was invested in the idea of uh, how we discriminate even from countries where uh, you would imagine that having been uh, victims and survivors of racism, we would, uh, you know, we would hold back from this, but we don't. So I think to answer your question, Aparna, uh, it's a it's a global phenomenon. I mean, we that that's the way human beings are probably conditioned. It comes from uh, a lot of uh, history that is repeated and again and again uh, that makes us so aware uh, of color of varna and and you know caste is something which is endemic to the indian mm -hmm. situation so i think it's it's there it's pretty much there and we are after all said and done we are colonial subjects we have been for a very long time and we haven't yet decolonized the mind so that's yeah. That's a complex one. Yes. Devushri, how much time do we have? And would you like uh, Aparna to read something? Dulidi, you, you all have a lot of time. So this is very going well, because I think one of the things that we're just thinking that these are very essential uh, issues that we talk about whenever we're talking about diasporic identity and we always talk about lived experiences so it's good that these are coming across right now and i'm sure we'll have queries at the end you have time like uh, we're here for another hour so you have time wonderful so can, can I, may, may i ask uh, may i ask Aparna a few questions about uh, two of her short stories which uh, which uh, spoke to me uh, greatly and it's it's really a kind of uh, identity uh, issue absolutely in reverse and and i'm talking about aparna the story that appealed to me very much 
I think briefly I mentioned this to you, uh, the short story which was pub where was it published? The one about your trip on the train to Shiliguri? Right, that was in the Malahat Review. Right. So do you want to tell us uh, just a synopsis and then explain to us this idea of how racism in reverse worked? In fact, what I was talking about a second ago, about how uh, we also practice this othering pretty well in, in India. Sure. Um, well, okay, this was in the context of me um, traveling to Shiliguri. Um, I was uh, in Bengal, I was visiting family members, um, and I wasn't able to get um, uh, a train ticket that would have been um, a sort of sheltered one that was a, um, a first class ticket um, or uh, air conditioned ticket. I had to um, travel in a second um, alert from Google second class Google. ticket. Alistair, if you um, don't think COVID 19 is real right now, you are an idiot. And I'm sorry, my computer just um, acted very strangely. Here we go. Um, yes, so I was, um, I got in the middle of the night after waiting um, at uh, Shanti Niketan. Uh, I was by myself. Um, and it was dark. Um, the train was completely dark when I got in. I had to wait there on the platform in Shatiniketon for hours before the, the train uh, arrived. And once I got into uh, the train, they could only hear my, my speech. They could not see me at all. Um, and someone had already taken my, my uh, seat. So uh, this person, I could not move. I could not move him at all. He refused to go. So I thought I had no uh, place to stay, spent the, spend the night in the train. And, um, and finally, um, the actual conductor took me to another place, uh, which was full of other people. Um, but I did have the, the seat that was in the, the, upper, upper, um, uh, the upper seat. So I managed to climb on, but with my shoes on. And the people who were sitting in the same section uh, began to mock me for having um, climbed up with my shoes on and made a number of comments about um, me, making it clear that they did not know I was uh, a person of Indian origin. So um, it, it just, uh, you know, a lot of... Uh, hilarity can uh, continue because they they saw that I was a woman of Indian origin in the morning after having made a number of insults um, about my behavior, um, thinking that I was a Westerner who wouldn't understand. So that is what uh, the story is essentially about. Um, and the go ahead, Aparna, go ahead. Um, I think you wanted me to bring up to bring up something about um, racism. Um, I was actually treated very differently uh, when um, the other passengers knew that I was a person of Indian origin. Um, and it, it reminded me that I had an acceptance um, in this country that I'd never experienced in, uh, in Canada, that um, these perfect strangers yet seem to understand me and to forgive me in a way um, for, have, for all of my strange behaviors, um, then, then Canadians, white Canadians, um, ever would have. So uh, that's really what the story is about. Um, Aparna, I want to uh, turn your attention to an aspect of uh, great interest today. Uh, in the world of diasporic Asian um, publishing. So if I were to ask you, and if you speak to publishers, uh, whether they are in uh, America or in Canada or even in England, my experience has been when I discuss how they came about publishing, say, someone like Mystery, or someone like Ramesh Gunasekara, the Sri Lankan novelist, or even Roy, uh, which is a different story because of David Godwin, her wonderful literary agent. Publishers in the West, whether it's a Haitian writer or a Caribbean writer, and 
Indian, Pakistani, whatever, Chinese writer, they want a piece of the exotic. This itself is such a colonial construct. They will happily publish. They tell you up front, please give us that, give us that exotic East, you know, as if it were something they can sell by, something that they can market by. They don't want to know about white Canada. They don't want to know about our experiences in Canada. How do you how do you configure that uh, as a writer? And what has been your experience? Well, an excellent question. Um, given that I I had a brief um, experience with the publishing uh, world in Canada. Um, I have actually only been able to publish in Canada once, and I did not uh, try as energetically as I could have, possibly, but I agree with you completely that there is a very limited interest in uh, second-generation Canadian works by second-generation Canadian uh, Canadians, unless they can put in a bit of that exotic. Um, I think there is actually a problem in Canada, and I think it is because it has 22%, only a 22% uh, population of people of color that it is um, actually falling backward um, compared to the states. Um, and this became clear to me. I published much more easily in, in the states, and um, they have a percentage now um, close to 40% um, of people of color. So, and they, you know, I think a lot of that has to do with a very strong black community. Um, when I was the Montreal Review of Books, I was allowed to travel to Toronto for events um, that were um, featuring um, all Canadian publishers. So I was able to see them. Um, I was able to speak with them um, in rooms full of these publishers all around the country. and there was one other person of color in the room. Um, for one of the events, there were about 50 people in that room. And that one other person of color was a government official, um, someone with uh, from um, uh, Canada, Canadian Arts uh, Council or something like that. Um, otherwise, everyone was white. Uh, why is that? Is that because people who like Bharati Mukherjee um, decide early that they need to go to the States to make it big, to get published? I don't know. My guess is that in Canada, you need to be um, someone who is in a canoe um, near a small town in order to be considered a real Canadian. Uh, you need to write about that. Um, otherwise, you need to be writing as though you were something exotic that just flew in. Um, only then will they, they think there's something in it for them. Very true. Well said. Um, on, 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 on the same kind of... of uh boat as as we've been riding um i want to draw your attention to what appropriately professor Dottore has uh, invoked with anahe dashtagard you know she once told a story in a seminar which i was attending uh about what a traumatic experience it was and why she became an activist educator she went on a trip with young girl guides and the leader of the girl guide was preparing dinner for them and this incident stuck in her mind so fast that she could not forget it till she transformed it into a piece of writing and this is what happened the cook for the evening turned around who was also a, a leader of the girl guides and said hey there girl can you give me a can opener from there and she said i was frozen solid because i couldn't see any can opener anywhere the woman almost pushed her aside she almost fell 
And then uh, Anayat says, she ripped open a drawer, pulled out the can opener, and she, you know, brandished it in front of Anahid and said, so you come from somewhere where you don't know what a can opener is? And Anahid shared with us at the lecture that because they were from a very privileged family from their homeland, she had only seen can openers that were electric. So she wouldn't have known a can opener, which was a can opener manually uh, used. So she says that this incident was ironic because in the girl guides, what you want to do is to make sure that there's equitable uh, distribution of respect. And what you're doing as a leader of the girl guide is just doing the opposite. So lived experiences, I think, make us what we are, Aparna. Would you have any uh, anecdotes to share? I'm sure you would. Uh, that. Um, I'm not sure if there's an anecdote that I um, have that's quite um, like that. Um, but I, I do have a comment, which is that um, I think that another problem with the way Indians are seen who come from privileged families um, is that that is um, another thing that is often criticized as, um, and I think that it's often used by the host country um, against immigrants who come from privileged families that um, there's all sorts of methods to bring them down. And one of the things is to remind them that um, you may be privileged in the country you come from, but that's not how we see you. Um, and there's also, I think, one of the things that is often covered up um, is the fact that many of the things, as you mentioned, that are done here are, are the same as those things that are done uh, in Canada. Um, no, uh, the average Canadian will still think of Indian privilege as vicious. Um, whereas Canadian privilege um, is not, it's not quite as vicious. So I'm not sure if that, that addresses what you were saying, but. No, um, no, no. I think, I, I think you unveiled another uh, uh, level, another package. And that is that, uh, you know, those of us who uh, come there with enough uh, shoring up on language, you know, uh, they cannot, you know, the, 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 the larger community um, realizes that perhaps we have something that they haven't got. And uh, it's not even a white privilege that will get them, get them that epistemic um, uh, level of, of superiority. And the fact that they cannot be violent to us uh, epistemically, I think that challenges them and that sort of dislodges them from a space of superiority. Um, and I think you might have, I have uh, learned, uh, you know, to, to s not swallow my goal, but to give it right back. I've been asked, oh, and by, by a colleague uh, at the University of Toronto, who was from the States, by the way, how does a woman of color, he said to me, uh, who's just come to Canada, I believe, a few years ago, where did you learn your English? And my answer was, right on the plane as I was getting here. <laughs> so, uh, you're absolutely right. You know, um, if you have a student from the Centre uh, Canadian Studies from uh, JUCL, uh, go there, uh, you know, would be perfectly fine in the classroom to discuss theoretical paradigms. And that might surprise uh, the level of uh, of the class because 
it would be unexpected. Um, and I think we have a few students from uh, the center who have gone, at least one that I can remember, who stands her ground and gives it as back as well as she gets it. That's, I think, Ragini Chakraborty, whom many of you know. But um, anyway, Oporna, uh, 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 perhaps uh, Devushri, uh, how, how are we doing there? Okay, uh, uh, I can ask her a couple of questions. Is that okay? Perfectly. Perfectly okay, Julie. And I also think if uh, some of our students have a few questions yes, yes. for both of you, that would be wonderful. Will Aparna read for 15 minutes? Yeah, or? let, let, yeah, let Aparna read for at least 10 minutes. Yes. Okay. okay, great. Um, I'm going to, I last time I timed this, it was about uh, 13 minutes, so let me know. Um, I will That's try to give it up a bit. That's fine. 13 is fine, open up. Go ahead. Okay. Great. Can you hear me? Can yes, you, uh, absolutely. Yes? Okay. Okay, absolutely. okay, the story is called Inheritance, and it is going to be uh, published uh, within a year in uh, Bellingham Review, which um, is based in Washington. I hadn't known she was there. The young woman, small and slightly hunched, was on the couch in the sitting room when I came downstairs. One hand balanced a cup of ice cream, the other held a tiny spoon. Thick spectacles overshadowed her pretty face. When I burst in, denouncing the Indian legal system, she peered up at me. I appeared for a moment in the shimmer of her lenses. My mother, maternal grandmother, aunt and uncle were also in the room. My father had died five years earlier. I stopped my complaints long enough to say hi to the girl, then resumed them. My lawyer had done it again, failed to warn me of a procedure that must be completed before the final hearing to for me to settle my paternal grandmother's will. Now I had to fetch a document from my bank. As I swung open the front doors of my two-story stronghold, I turned and apologized to the girl for my outburst. She shook her head as if to say, it's nothing. My aunt and uncle down from Shiliguri were scouting for a bride on behalf of a friend whose only son, Amit, was unmarried. My mother's yoga teacher had recommended this girl and Amit had come by to see my aunt. A 30-ish lawyer, he'd interrupted me repeatedly, at one point declaring that he considered it easy to be a professor. I was an assistant professor of philosophy at the University of Toronto. My relatives loved matchmaking. Fortunately, they had given up on me. As I marched off in the late morning heat, I wondered when it must be, what it must be like for the girl to face four scrutinizing adults alone. Whose idea had it been to give her that child-sized container of ice cream? She had looked to be 20. Supposing she snagged a meat, would she cope with his overbearing ways? When I got back, sweaty and tired, the girl was gone. No one was talking in the Baitak Kana. I passed through an open door into the adjoining kitchen. Mukti, the maid, was sitting on the floor grinding spices. I smiled in her direction, but she seemed in a bad mood. I grabbed a juice box from the fridge and sat on the couch next to my mother under the whirring ceiling fan. The small square room was cool. The grilled windows onto the quiet street were unshuttered. From time to time, a passerby, including the vegetable walla and the neighborhood physician, peered inside with sun-blinded eyes. She is 22 and finished her BA English. Everything is finished, my grandmother said in Bengali. What number did she give? 
asked my aunt. Bukti, Amar Jalar bottle deal. Her uncle's number, she said, replied my mother, holding out a small sheet of paper. But she said she had an older brother, didn't she? Ha, huh, declared my grandmother. Why didn't he come with her? Why didn't she give his number? Isn't he still studying? asked my aunt. The brother is 28, my mother looked at my aunt. He is working as an engineer. He brooded. My grandmother sat in a white disapproving heap close to my aunt on the divan opposite the couch. So rarely did she move that she seemed part of the divan. My uncle, a long-headed man of 60 with a droopy moustache, was silent and shapeless in a chair next to the divan. So why didn't he come with her, Didi? asked my aunt, resting her chin in her palm. My mother said nothing, eyes thoughtful. My aunt sprang up and took the paper my mother was holding in her hand. Let me call, she said. She extracted her cell phone from her purse and moved into the kitchen. Couldn't the uncle come with her, my grandmother muttered. Uncle, brother, someone should have come with her. Why, Didi, di, why, Dida, I questioned, turning to her. My grandmother's mouth dropped open. We had met on three previous occasions, each spanning a couple of days. My uncle had asked my mother to look after her during his assignment in Assam. Because that is how things are done here, said my mother. Mukti, Dorja Kolona. My aunt was talking on the phone. After a minute, she came into the Baitak Kana. That is so strange, she said. He didn't know she was trying to get married. He said he didn't know anything about it. He didn't want to talk to me. Why wouldn't he want to talk to us? queried my mother. They began to speak so quickly in Bengali, I would not follow. My uncle stayed apart, slack-bodied in his short-sleeved shirt and brown-gray pants, as though none of this was his affair. My aunt paced, navy blue sari swirling, while my mother played with the sun-oranged folds of her ancho. The sisters were swift, keen. What had transformed them? What's going on? I demanded. She seemed a perfectly nice girl to me. They looked at me with unseeing eyes. My aunt sat down on the divan. My grandmother tossed her silky white braid. The girl usually does not come alone like that, my mother said. It seems her family does not want her to marry. Why wouldn't they? We are trying to find out. She said her mother was ill and her father was dead. Usually, in that case, the family will not want her to marry. I know family will want their son to marry a girl in that situation. Why not? I exclaimed. My aunt began badgering my mother to call someone in that soft, plaintive way of hers. My mother said, I will call, and swept off into the kitchen, where I heard her having a conversation on the house phone. Their intensity was peculiar. Marriage had not meant liberation for either. The matches of both my mother and aunt at 20 and 24 respectively had been arranged and the guidelines for doing so had been purely impersonal, family background, wealth, education. My aunt had, according to my mother, been mistreated by her in-laws and neglected by her husband. My parents had divorced when I was 18. My mother came back into the kitchen and sat on the edge of the couch. Did she say anything? Asked my aunt. Mukti, Amar mobile ta eno. She said the girl's mother is very sick. Sick with what? I interjected. And who was that? My mother blinked. Something mental. 
That was my yoga teacher. She says the girl's family expects her to look after her mother. If she marries, there will be no one to look after her mother. She could share the responsibility with her brother. Chotamama took care of Vida for a while, didn't she? Didn't he? My mother did not respond. I remembered her anger the last time she and my grandmother had asked my uncle whether my grandmother could live with him. He should share that responsibility, I said. My aunt, uncle, and grandmother listened in perturbed silence. My mother sighed. You don't understand how things work here. The mother usually lives with the son, not the daughter, if both children are married. If the daughter marries, the mother cannot live with her because she will not want to live on her son-in-law's charity. That is how things are perceived. So the mother would have to live with her son and depend on him and his wife. I thought about this. So the girl's brother is making sure he's not left with his mother on his hands. Probably. Mukti, Friji Rako. I felt a rush of anger. Was it natural for that babyish girl to graduate to nothing but lifelong caregiving? Granted, Amit was no prize, but he or someone like him probably represented liberty and social power to her. I'd shown up in India once with a man I loved, and family members treated me with sudden deference. I did not keep this to myself. Yes, you're right, my mother said, while my aunt gazed at me sympathetically. My grandmother, who did not understand my English when it was too quick, looked from me to my mother to my aunt. Ibolche, she said. Gichuna, replied my mother in irritation. What does the mother have, I asked. Something, my mother hesitated. Mental, I know, but what? I don't know. How do you know she's mentally ill? I just know from the way my yoga teacher said things. I glanced at my mother with mistrust. She had recently been ill with a bout of depression, her second in six years. She was now on medication and better than I'd ever seen her. Do you think the girl should have to spend her life looking after her mother? I asked. And why hasn't Chotomama said anything about taking care of Dita? My mother straightened. Of course, I don't think that. I think it is very wrong what is happening. And turning to my aunt, she began arguing. Shouldn't she be able to marry? Why isn't her family supporting her? Why isn't her family supporting her? It's cruel what they are doing. Why do they always do this to women? Why doesn't her uncle help her? She is a young girl. It is so unfair. She jumped up and began moving around the room. My aunt sat with head bowed. And the brother. What kind of brother is that? He can't help his only sister get married? He is so selfish. But no one will go against him because he is the son. For a daughter, it is different, my grandmother began. Why? My mother asked. I want my daughter to be happy, even if you didn't care for yours. My grandmother subsided into silence, brow aggrieved. You see, this is how they think here, my mother said. Why did you move back here then? I asked. A confused expression overspread my mother's face. I don't know. How can you not know? I asked. Mukti, cried my grandmother. Oh, Mukti, Amar Shal Ta'ino. Mukti, echoed my aunt and mother. Mar Shal Ta'ino. That's the end. Wow. So well captured. Love the dialogue, Aparna. Thank what you. What did you What did you all think? Come on, let's have 
Uh, the first, the JU uh, students, uh, Debushri, is that okay? Shall we start with a response to that short story? Sure. sure. Go ahead. Who's going first? <laughs> Come on. I don't have any question. I just want. I just want to comment. It's a sure. beautiful frame of nostalgia, I must. Mama, I really want to read this. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Now that the ice is broken. Yeah. I mean, I do have a few questions, really, but I would be hoping that some of the students would respond first. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And you have, a, I think you have a couple of members of the audience also, I think, who are here. Yeah, but before, absolutely. But before that, yeah. we would like, like our we, own... We can have them speaking as well, and maybe the students would pick up later on. So perfectly <laughs> <true> with us. <laughs> Dr. Dr. Roman Bhattacharya, you can sort of, sort of, I think, relate to some of the aspects of that story, no? Thank you so much, Julie and Aparna. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. It was a fascinating story, as Julie said, written so beautifully. And uh, I, I was having parallel reactions because with my heart, I was, I was able to hear the, the liminal text. But with my mind, I kept hearing Julie's comment from the earlier conversation, which was about othering the other. And that there was, you know... Uh, something that Julie and I have talked about before, which is the hierarchies that exist within the other as well. And it was very poignant and very beautiful, Aparna. And if I may just for a second make a, di a very different kind of comment. I'm Roma Bhattacharji. I'm from Calcutta, but I've worked very closely with Canadians and, uh, you know, held meetings in Canada. And uh, I, I just couldn't help noticing the 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 interesting insider outsider outsider insider perspective because obviously within canada you very much have the same kind of tensions between indigenous people settler nations francophone canada uh, 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 anglophone canada and uh, however it's very interesting in terms of canadian foreign policy the projection is always in terms of gender equality is very high on our agenda that's how canada projects itself in the world and uh, it's always cited as an example you know of a, a nation they actually put their money often uh, i'm from the united nations in, into stuff that promotes gender equality so i'm fascinated by all these hierarchies because i'm sure within the nation you have your own intersections you know, for a moment, putting aside the issue of uh, post-coloniality as well as uh, indigenous people, the whole issue of the the you know the gender and and hierarchy hierarchies of power within, I'm sure, francophone Canada and anglophone Canada. There must be a whole series of hierarchies there, and that is then compounded when you know one is coming from the diasporic world or from uh, indigenous people and uh, just. Just a small thing that I attended a you know global women's leadership conference in the United States where the the heart of the matter was indigenous rights, uh, gender, and and whole issues of violence. And I wanted to ask you because it's very fascinating, even at the level of law. I mean, you are coming to it from the academy, but the academy is multi uh, uh, multi um, you know multidisciplinary. Even at the level of law where you have reservations of indigenous people. There, there are, the laws reflect that apartheid. So to put it crudely, a white man can go into the reservation, rape a woman and come out. The law protects him outside. So when he comes out, he's no longer in the jurisdiction of what is happening at the event of the site of violence. And I find that fascinating. I, mean, I don't know about Canada so much, but I find that fascinating. But even um, at the level of the law, we have these problems. Roma, I'm going to jump in, Aparna, if it's OK, just for a second and say, the law does not allow him to do that. It is the force of the law, you know, those who are supposed to protect uh, and and secure the law 
And though that is the police uh, department. But the law itself, and this is again something that I think both Aparna and I have researched, the law is not implemented. So Roma, you're absolutely right. It's not implemented. But in Canada, our rights and the charters are very clear. And these 4,000 deaths of the indigenous women that have taken place and the report on the missing and the murdered women show once again that we have the laws, but we don't implement them. And it's this, mm -hmm. in some ways, it's the same in India. We have very stringent laws against rape, against statutory rape, but we do not often implement them because of a corrupt and a moral compassless police force. Go ahead, Aparna. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Sorry, Aparna, you wanted to say something? Can't hear you. There we go. Um, yes, I, I mean, this is a huge problem. The only thing is, um, you know, re, uh, enforcing the law in Canada is a, is a major problem, continues to be a problem because the police are brutal. Um, in our country, they're absolutely brutal and they are overwhelmingly white. Um, uh, and there doesn't seem to be much of an effort to try to change that. Um, and I know that, but the, the, the point I wanted to make here is that with a country as wealthy as Canada, um, and with such a small population, you what is, what is Canada's excuse? Okay, India, um, and I, this isn't going to, I'm not saying that they have an excuse for lack of enforcement of the laws, but you can understand that in a developing country, um, it takes time before these things um, are going to be, and it's such a huge population, it's going to take time um, for there to be the kind of enforcement that's required, especially in rural areas. Um, what is Canada's excuse? Canada doesn't have an excuse. Um, and I know terrible um, case that's very close to me of a man who, uh, a white man, who was able to um, beat up a very promising young girl when she was a teenager um, to the point where she had to be hospitalized. And this was his girlfriend, uh, who she was indigenous. And um, he, this was, you know, decades ago, that woman has had to carry that with her, her whole life. Um, but that the police did absolutely nothing. And the police knew, the police knew this had happened. Um, how many other women, this is a woman who's close to my age, how many women in Canada uh, walk around knowing that the police were never able to, in one of the richest countries uh, in the world, were not willing or able to um, enforce the law for them. Absolutely. Shucharita, uh, would you like to say something? I think, Prothoma, you had your hand up here. Prothoma? Yeah, I think Prothoma wants uh, to ask a question. Yeah, Prothoma, go right ahead. Unmute He's... yourself. Unmute, oh. unmute, unmute, unmute Please yourself. Please introduce yourself, Prothoma. Please introduce yourself. Uh, Ma'am, uh, I am Prothuma, Prothuma from JUCL. I have opted for the Canadian Studies paper for my master's uh, uh, in uh, third semester. So my question to you is uh, that when we are talking about diaspora or studying about it, a special phrase comes to us in a repeated manner, that is becoming home. Okay, so and this discussion regarding the process of becoming home coming through ages, different generations and different in different ways. It has got different dimensions as well. But my question is to you is that the alienation process performed by asking in a constant manner that leave your baggage behind, leave your cultural baggage behind, don't take it here. So uh, what is your instant reaction and thoughts regarding that? And my another question is to you, ma'am, uh, uh, that uh, being defendant and being uh, in a process of defense mechanism to combat that question is the only political correct reaction to that, only political correct solution to that. That's all. 
That's a really good question. Um, go ahead, Julie, did you have something to say? Well, you know, that's my, f well, uh, very quickly, uh, Prathama, uh, keep your baggage at home and come here is the line that actually was said in my class by this Anglo-Canadian young boy. And that's why always, you know, that's always the front and center of the debate. They do believe that it's an unsullied landscape. It's a pretty landscape. We want you to come here. You're welcome to come here. But you have to follow the laws and the rules and the socializing that we have offer you in Canada. So don't, don't bring your movements, your rebellion on the street, your morchas and your dharnas over here. That's not how we function. So that's really the, the that is what the general feeling is that what we let you into our country. I'm speaking as the devil's advocate. Bujachuto, Prathama. Eta yo de front and center mone. Ekane ashcho for a better life. So if you want that better life, then you, there are some norms and rules. Bolo, Aparna, you, you, you have your say and then Prathama can do it. Okay. Ma'am, uh, I was saying that when you are in a classroom in a pedagogical process and where you are the teacher, okay, and your student, your uh, uh, children are asking you to keep your baggage behind, okay. So, is that it's very absurd thing to uh, take from a student for a teacher, I think. I think not because in Canada, not in the West, Prothoma. The, the the equations are different exactly what Aparna was saying you know this is the way they do things here so it's very much a cultural thing uh you know it's very much a cultural thing they will sit uh and have their sandwiches while you're talking and i draw a line there i say i don't want to see your souls you know show me your real souls or put your souls down into generally you can't see anything harassment there'll be a report against you you okay. you know and they're not saying it to me they're saying it to the other students the Sri Lankan students in class why are you doing this marcha and then finally there were tears in the class the Sri Lankan one Sri Lankan uh, woman actually broke down she said I can't get to my grandmother I don't know if she's dead or alive she's in Batikanoa. then there was some understanding so there has to be, a, I think that the only way this will change is if the white Anglo-Canadian, which is happening very slowly, uh, it is happening in Toronto because it's a more multicultural setup. Unless there's a conversation, am I right, Aparna? There has to be an exchange. Then there it can. Be. And I would also ask uh, um can you hear me? Um, Rotoma, I, I would ask you, you know, uh, who who is at home and who isn't? If someone is a second generation Sri Lankan um, who was born in Canada, why does the white man who is also going to be the descendant of immigrants, why does he or she have the right to say to that second generation Sri Lankan or someone who's, say, been in Canada for 30 years, what, what right does he have to say, um, keep your baggage at your home? This is that Canada is their home. Canada is the home of those people born there and people who became Canadian citizens and do them the great honor of choosing to be, as um, uh, Pierre Trudeau said, it is an honor to Canadians when an immigrant comes there. And that ha that was the traditional approach of Trudeau. Who decides what someone's home is, except for that person? If that person is a Canadian citizen, has was born in Canada or has lived there for many many decades, it's their home. They don't have a right to say, "Take your baggage." Who knows? I mean, that baggage. What is that baggage? That baggage is terror at a potential genocide or an actual genocide that occurred? You know, the con the conditioning is there. The, I'm talking about the 
majority Canadian, Aparna and Prathama, the conditioning is very simple. They are very aware of the history of refugees. Many Tamilians who came to us in Canada came as refugees. Sa Sham Salvadurai himself uh, talks about, you know, how he uh, came and, 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 you know, just escaped by the skin of their teeth. Um, coming to Canada, that journey was stupendously uh, charged with, with danger. So the white Canadian student who's in your class knows that you had no option. So they use sometimes when push comes to shove, when they see that their landscape is, you know, they're, they're frightened. So fear, yeah, yeah. Is, fear is the law, which has to be unlocked. And my admonishment to them is always to my class is try and listen. You are here to listen to each other. You are here as a young nation to understand the issues that have, that have been the cause of the suffering of the other in your class. So, you know, unless there is a dialogue, it will never change. It will be us against them. And Oporna is absolutely right. It is home to the second, third generation uh, Sri Lankan or Palestinian or uh, somebody who comes from Eritrea or Ethiopia, you know? So it, it's important to have the classroom as a space, I believe, to create a space of comfort where you can discuss these issues as the next generation who will be the catalysts for change in the way we look at it. Yeah. But Julie, uh, Julie, I was just wondering, uh, what about outside the classroom? Do you think there would be some kind of discrimination? I mean, I would not. You know how many visits I have paid yes. there. And I've spoken to a whole lot of people. Yes. But uh, all of them say that discrimination is there. Yes. Even people who have been there for 30 years, Absolutely. they are they are always saying that this, within different fields, in the, in the within academia also, I have known people of Indian origin who have been there. Uh, they are in uh, close to 60 now. And they yes. have been there yes. from the time when they were in their 20s. Yes. They are very open about it. That Absolutely. we have been fighting discrimination throughout all these years. Absolutely. So and how and would you account for that? I would say, Shuchorita, uh, that's hmm. uh, something which is endemic to the fabric of any Western society. You look at the kind exactly. of race, racism that goes on in France; it is horrific. But from the there was a French professor who told me, you know, what can we do? We have Moroccans, we have people from Algeria, who our jobs are at stake. This is an economics professor, a young economics professor. You look at Germany, any of the yes. European countries. And then, of course, I mean, we know the governmental attitudes of 72 million people who voted for Mr. Trump. We know where their uh, racism lies. And it's the yes. same. In, it's the same in Canada, Shucharita, you're spot on you're spot on this is the lived reality you know there are very so there's a disjunction right between yes. how canada would like to be projected yes. and what it is in reality absolutely multicultural you have a question the way you are pointing your finger <laughs> the thing is that i wanted to ask julie ma'am that when you are in money you asked that question ma'am that what is the there is a distortion between uh, in the class and outside the class and as a teacher as a uh, as a worker within the comfort zone and outside the yeah, comfort zone let me put it that way both the things at the both at the same time yes spot on and it can only change as we become more globalized. And this is where Shuchorita's point and Oporna's point and your point intersect. The difference between a nation which is tolerant and a nation which is accepting. There is a thin line between tolerance and acceptance. 
Tolerance is the government line of, oh, we are a multicultural, we work. And the acceptance level is what we live on a daily basis. And the question thrown at us in different ways, where did you learn your English? Like, oh, you know, really? You speak English? So you're right. Exactly. Julie, Julie, if I may share uh, one experience here before sure. I, you move on to Shuddha Deep, who has raised a hand. Uh, I was on a flight uh, from Calgary to Victoria. So a uh, white gentleman had the window seat and I was the, next to him. And then my husband was sitting beside me. So we, I just told him, wow. I told my husband, wow, look at the view outside you know the, the uh, plane was flying over the rockies it was beautiful outside i said wow look at the view outside he said uh, oh, i wish i could uh, click a few pictures but i i can't reach out from you normal course we were speaking in english this gentleman next to me he looked at me and said where are you from so i said uh, we are are you canadians do you live here i said no 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 because I thought he found it strange that I was marveling at the beauty of the Rockies. So I said, no, no, we are visiting. So it's so beautiful. I was really moved. She said, yeah, but how come you speak English like that? I mean, I was, I didn't know how to react. <laughs> you should have said we go to school to teach on, on elephant back, you know. And we have to fight the yeah, time. You, I told you, Ju Julie, I got similar questions from uh, students in the US who were doing an India studies program. One was, how do you uh, travel to the university? I said, I mean, I, what do you mean? What's the, the, what does that question mean? Elephant back, then do you need to arm yourself? I said, why should I need to arm myself? And I tried to imagine myself riding on Gorihat flyover on elephant back with a gun in my hand in case a tiger comes out from somewhere. <laughs> I mean, that's the reality. I mean, that's how we are viewed. Anyway, more of that later. Yeah. Shuddhadeep had a question, I think. Shuddhadeep, go ahead. Go yes, ahead. yes ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, ma actually, we are talking about uh, this, the whites, the Canadian whites indifference and the lack of dialogue. I think uh, it is also, as you were telling that whenever we uh, start questioning them about their indifference, they say that, why are you uh, talking about indifference? Because there is a great indifference, you know, uh, attitude of indifference and uh, atmosphere of inequality in your own country. So few uh, the protest of the farmers that are going on right now, uh, I was seeing all these videos of the Sikh community prote protesting in Canada. And uh, a few days back, the prime minister of Canada also uh, voiced his, uh, his support and sympathy towards the peaceful protests of the farmers. Uh, from our side, uh, the ruling government, uh, did not entertain his sympathy or support. Uh, they said that in foreign interference is not allowed because we are not living in a globalized country, uh, in a globalized world, and uh, that they do not know who we are, so they cannot interfere. Since we are talking about cultural brokering today, uh, how, how do you think that uh, this lack of dialogue or this very uh, intolerance, if you may say, or uh, rejection, non-acceptance, whatever it is, of not allowing the outsider to, to look at us or listen to us and to communicate, even if they want to, to be stopping this. How is this affecting cultural brokering? And will it uh, result in you know, the migration or uh, lack of belongingness, which actually happened in the 1970s indigenous uh, community land reforms? And uh, so how is this cultural brokering being affected today? I think you've heard my voice uh, uh, for a long time. I let Aparna handle that first, uh, and then I'll jump in if required. Yeah, sure. Well, I think that um, a lot of this has to do with uh, the strength of the, the far right um, in both India and in the States, and the effect of that um, everywhere. Um, now that there is um, a new president um, in the States, I'm wondering if um, maybe you can um, help me with this, that now that um, you know, a more global outlook 
is going to appear in the United States and also is exists in Canada um, with the Liberals to some extent anyway. Um, how do you think that is going to influence uh, voting in, in India? Do you think that, because I'm sure all of you saw all the pictures of um, that were sent around uh, making a connection between Modi and uh, Trump as, as sort of these best friends. Um, what are the chances you think for, for um, a turnover here in this country um, soon? Um, I think I will call upon uh, our uh, historian here, Dr. Harish Mehta. Would you like to comment on that? I think you would be uh, superbly uh, and knowledgeable on that and have an opinion. And then I'll see if I want to jump in. Unmute yourself, Harish. Um, yeah. Um, I'm not sure what the question is. Very quickly, uh, Shudodip, the end, uh, you know, the what we're talking about is with the change the of question? government. Oh, OK, do you want to repeat the question and go ahead? Uh, I think basically what I want Harish to comment on is the point that Aparna brought up, which will answer your question, Shudodip, uh, which is basically that with the change of government in the US, with Mr. Biden coming in, uh, and the nexus between uh, Mr. Trump and Mr. Uh, Prime Minister of India being kind of, uh, you know, broken now with, with the new uh, era coming in in the U.S. of leadership. Do you think that will change the way uh, the right, the right wing in the world uh, dynamics uh, will take a, a back seat? Uh, is that a question for me? Are you asking, is that for me? Um, I, I think um, that uh, Sudhadeep was talking about India specifically. Am I incorrect in that? that I, was, um, I was basically talking about the conversation between India and Canada and how uh, yes. by stopping this conversation, we are being affected culturally. So Harish, the question from Sudhadeep is the, uh, the farmers movement which we were talking about yesterday and uh the fact that mr modi did not uh align his sights with uh mr justin trudeau and will that change or why did we do that why did we not align with mr trudeau on this issue is that a question yes. for me yes yes harish uh, uh okay I think I missed the first question about the uh, the rightward turn uh, in American politics uh, and whether that turn is sustained or not. I think that turn is is past, and I think there's no going back. The right, the forces of the right have been unleashed, and there's no way to put them back in the box. And the Canadian system is going to get very badly impacted by the American turn to the right. And as you know that uh, in Canada, the right wing is out of the box as well. Uh, so it, it's rather difficult to uh, to imagine a world where the right is going to be in decline. Uh, never before have we seen the right in academia emerge the way we are seeing it now. Uh, you know, um, if you remember in America, uh, in my field, which is American foreign relations history, uh, you know, uh, during the Reagan era, there was a strong move uh, to the left, which was rebelling against the American involvement in the Vietnam War. So during the Vietnam War, a leftward move had happened. That sustained itself all the way down, and it and then you saw a rightward turn again under Bush Sr., who brought America back into war 
in Kuwait, in, in, in uh, Iran, in Iraq. And since then, uh, history teaching has become a nightmare. Uh, it is impossible in, uh, to teach a, a course frankly and freely in American, in America, in parts of America, uh, because you can get lynched in the class by a student. You know, um, the, the, the people have been beaten up. Professors have been beaten up uh, outside class. Uh, they've been heckled in class. You know, for even questioning things like, um, should we have been in America? Should 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 American troops have gone to Vietnam in the first place? You know. <laughs> So, so that's that. And um, yeah. I think that's gone. I mean, you're... Uh, yeah. yeah, and uh, well, I, I'm I, sure... Can I, can I, Dr. Mehta, can I bring you back to the question in hand? Uh, this is, this is think, yes, yes, really, yes. Thank you. I mean, I think that's a very insightful point made by Harish Bhai about the ongoing issues and the way that he's talking about uh, the change of power and what it brings and what it entails for us at large. I think we've been all part of that lived experience, all of us over here, for different reasons. And I'm glad that you brought up such a vital question. But I'm sorry to act as timekeeper here. We have two more questions. I mean, there's one by Shushanto uh, Mondur who wanted to ask. And there's one that Roshni has typed in the chat box. So I just wanted to draw your attention. Thank you. Because it's an intriguing part. I think history teaches us a lot. Thank you. So, uh, Devashi, will you, uh, will I, uh, then who do should we Do you want me to Shushantu? read out to the question? Yeah, yeah I know. It's Shushantu, right here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Shushantu, you had a question. Are you with us? Yes, ma'am. I have a yes. question. So, if you could please ask your question oh, and yes, identify. Oh. Also, introduce yourself, please, briefly. I am Susanto Mondal from Vishwabharati University, presently pursuing master's in English literature. Thank you. I have a question on the, I have seen in the in the slides that dead other, so what does the term dead other mean and the crime, one cannot know about them without doing any crime against them. So this point I want to know. Oh, yeah, Julie, I think Shushan yeah. had asked this earlier on as well. Yes, That's yes. to your slide. Yes, yes exactly. Yeah, it so refers thank to you, Shushan. Is it possible to go back to the slide? Because it explains itself very quickly. It was slide, it was slide yes. number. Yeah, it was slide number four. The murder of indigenous women, I think. Yes, got it. Yes. And uh, meanwhile, I'll just, while uh, Madhuruma is preparing it, I will read out Roshni's question, Juliri. Terrific. Just, Terrific. Wanted, uh, just wanted to bring another small instance to light. I have a sister of mine. Uh, sir. Uh, I have a sister of mine who has been living in Canada from the age of 18. She's 32 now. I've seen her typical empathy for the indigenous people. As late as 2016, she commented how they appeared dirty and ready to rebel at the drop of the hat. Coming from a minority, the brown diaspora, how do we identify this? Ignorance, indifference, or like Julie Ma'am commented, othering of the others. So sorry, I'm unable to speak on the mic because of the noise around me. Sorry. Okay, so uh, uh, Apona, yeah. will you? It first and then I'll jump in. Sure. Um, I'm not sure. I guess she she is someone who um, immigrated to Canada um, herself. I I think this goes back to what um, I was speaking about with Julie earlier that it takes um, time and effort to identify uh, your allies. Um, in colonizing countries, countries that continue to colonize. Um, and that when you go to a country like Canada in your youth, um, you may not immediately see that uh, you are the other and that um, you are the other in connection with other 
others, that you, um, you're not special because you are a doctor or because you are a lawyer or because you made it um, as a professor. It takes a long time to be able to make those alliances. Um, so the only thing I can say about your sister is that she, she may not be yet at that stage where, um, and she, she exists in a place which is still very, yes, very right wing. Um, certainly the Trudeau we have now is more conservative than his father was. Um, so she, she may also be um, digesting a lot of the, the feeling around her um, and the politics around her um, that are coming from the far right. I, um, yeah, that's all I could say about that. Um, very quickly, since we're short of time, Roshni, uh, excellent, uh, excellent uh, invocation of your sister, because I know a good many people who are South Asian and go to the extent of saying that they are alcoholic, they are druggies, we don't want to spend our time. That is not Canada. I've heard this so many times. It is shocking from my own. Um, you know, if, you, if you're a cab driver, uh, you know, if you're going from one place to another, and if that's a South Asian, they will, and you know, inevitably, if you're interested, you will turn the conversation to these complex issues. If you want to know more about Canada uh, on the grassroots level, and they'll tell you, yeah, look, to kuch karte hi nahi hai. The useless man, in ke upar itna paisa kyu karcha karta hai government? Ye to Canada nahi hai. Ham log Canada banaye hai. Even, even, you know what I'm uh, saying? What you South know? Asian people from the academy also, Julie, yes, who are yes, 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 in yes. literature per se. Yes. I have heard them this Canadian literature. Do they write? Do they publish? Who publishes them? What yeah. do they write? I yes. mean, I have faced these problems. Yes, quite right. To, uh, you know, to be very honest, Chuchurita and Devushri, what you're doing at the center of Canadian studies at JUCL is it, 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 it amounts to a kind of huge progression in thought. Because in Canada, this is very rare, what you're doing. Bringing indigeneity and bringing the idea of consolidation, of dialogue, of inclusion is not there on the ground in Canada. These people are seen as the dirty other, in, in inverted commas, what Roshni says. Her sister probably feels, you know, they, they get on a metro, they get on a, a on the subway, and you think, my God, this is not Canada. So it's the perception of the other which is really other, and you don't see yourself as another. You align yourself, as Harish was saying, you're so right-wing, you align yourself to white Canada, not admitting to yourself that you are also the other. Does that answer your question? Yeah, the, their books are also not sold in chapters or in Indigo. You will never get any book by indigenous authors in any of those stores. You have to go have separate stores. I remember yes. there's one on Spadina, but yes, otherwise they are just not available. Yes, absolutely. Roshni, right? They yes. ask me. Yes, you remember that store on Harvard, um, Shuchurita? women's uh, bookstore do yes. you remember that store you know they've closed yes, that yes, down now absolutely. they've closed it down they've closed it down this is where we would oh find books like this. yeah yeah shushanto are you there yes ma'am Shushanto, yes, yes. to me and few share uh toward an ethic of remembering what she's basically saying mm. is that how can i speak on behalf of the dead other this is mm -hmm. the you know this is someone speaking from a place who is so sensitive that it's just like Gayatri Spivak saying, Can the subaltern speak? Can we speak for the subaltern? And in the same way, 
And mm -hmm. Piyush is saying that even if we were to speak out against what has been done, for instance, to the Cree, um, you know, to the to the Cree um, a murdered victim, um, it would be an act of violence because we are presuming to be speaking about a situation. The woman Helen Betty Osborne, you know, so. I think it's it's the theory of the other uh, who is not able to speak up for themselves. Do we have a right to speak for that dead person? Shushanto, tika che? Shushanto? Yes, ma'am. Okay, explain. Yes, ma'am. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, Devashri, back to you. Shucharita, back to you. No, uh, yeah. No, I just wanted to quickly respond to uh, Shuddhadeep again, Julie, uh, because uh, I, the, the thing that he's talking about, and I think that's a very relevant one that he's talking about. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, uh, as part of the even discussion, when I, we thought of actually putting a link to one of the recent news items that he was referring to, we didn't because it didn't give us an entire picture of the diaspora, but just a section of the diaspora. And I think that's why we decided against it. Uh, but the other thing that probably Shuddhudeep has to take into account when he's looking at this particular incident, incident in history is what starts with the Gadar movement and then the Kumagata Maru and the Air India. And, so, and also the fact that uh, uh, also the fact that you're looking at uh, for example, for instance, the entire gamut of protests in the United Kingdom as well. So you, you're looking at, so I would ask you to think of this as a trajectory of history and look at what this means in terms of, and it, it isn't just what you're seeing. What we're seeing is just an incident and even that has happened because as a repercussion or as a reaction, but one would like one would probably need to go much deeper into the dynamics of these repercussions and going back to this whole idea of becoming home is also related to economic viability and much of these protests and much of the reasons behind these protests is related to that economic dynamics which has certain leanings as we know of them that is what has happened all through and uh, and also because the covid-19 situation makes uh, makes it possible to seal international borders to a large extent and that works in a certain way and one needs to also understand those the political social and economic implications of such things it, it's just not cultural it's extremely extremely political and you probably need to understand the this the processes by which the gather movement found expression and also was the gather files were removed were you know they were down and not taken into consideration so you've had all of these things happening together so probably look at this particular movement in relation to the others and see how they're different and also see where how the, has the nature of protest changed what is it about the nature of protest so maybe that should help you look at certain questions that cannot be answered at the moment because yes, these are unresolved so issues right now right. i you. hope that tells you what to think about Yes, but um, uh, one more mm. thing I wanted to ask uh, after Professor Harish Mehta. Uh, uh, he was talking that the US and Canada are both uh, kind of uh, under the left government now. And so does that mean that India is uh, isolated like an island uh, uh, under this right wing? Uh, is the conversations over or? Uh, I don't think uh, this is, I mean, if I could, because I'm not sure if Harish Bhai has a connection right now. So, Julidi, with your permission, if I could respond to Shuddhudi. Yeah, uh, so, yes. Uh, so, one of the things uh, that you probably have to take cognizance of is we 
I wish we could call ourselves in isolation, but I don't yeah. think we are in isolation. Yeah. All right. So uh, I think that answers your question. Yes, absolutely. All right. Absolutely, ma'am. Thank you. Yes. I don't think we have any further questions this evening, but it was a very, very interesting, extremely interesting session. And I hope uh, Julie and Aparna, both of you enjoyed uh, presenting today because I'm Very sure much. Our, our students learned a lot also. Thank and you for I, the invitation. Uh, would you like to just end with a few words about what we are currently doing at the center? Just sure. Julie knows very yeah. well, but for the, there are a lot of people here today who are not very familiar yeah. with the kind of work we are doing. So maybe yes, a, yes. two or three minutes maximum, not more than that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so one of the things that we've been concerned at the center and which was something that we talked about, we've been interested in diaspora studies and we've been interested in indigenous studies in a big way. We have, I mean, one of the things that happen is that, you know, why would we study Canadian literature in the Department of Comparative Literature at an Indian university? And especially when we've been focusing on marginalized literatures, we've been focusing on unheard voices. So how does Canada as a developed nation, Canada as part of the first world figure into our imagination at all? So I think one of the reasons that it does figure figure into our imagination are these voices that are unheard within the Canadian context itself. And uh, and I think that is something that we've been working for a large extent at the center. We've been involved in projects related to indigeneity. We've had collaborations, of course. We've had collaborations with uh, many universities in Canada and, of course, the United States, as well as uh, with South Africa, with uh, Japan, in fact, and basically with Norway and with other institutes and also the United Kingdom recently, uh, which has been seeing this big boom on indigenous studies. And I think that's what we've been doing at the center. We, we've also been very blessed with very promising young scholars who have made our task at the center much easier. I mean, far easier because it helps us to have people around thinking. You, you, you will find people who've been quiet, but who've been working equally hard for the center, people like Rohini, Roshni, Krishnendu who are here. And then there are these younger folks who are learning. There are some who are not here with us, but they're always there with us otherwise. I think so that's been working in the center. So we, we're always very happy to share with the center and we hope we, we've initiated and we're very, very glad that Aparna and Julie agreed to, you know, inaugurate this diasporic conversation because you, you realize that, you know, one of the, I think, pitfalls about diaspora is that this othering is extremely judgmental. This othering is extremely judgmental. There's a lot of patronization towards this othering. And it, it is very difficult to initiate a conversation on uh, diaspora, I believe. It's much more difficult because one assumes that you understand everything about it. And also one has these presumptions of labels that becomes a difficult proposition. Uh, I mean, and uh, and I think these are things that probably, I mean, I don't know if Shavuta is here, but she, she would have been a, a better person to respond to this particular Shaguta thing. Shavuta is here, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I can't Shaguta. see Nani. She can no, she don't think she's there anymore. Huh? No, no, not here. She was here. We introduced her. I mean, I mean she's huh. the diaspora scholar at the center. Right? So we, we, we've been engaged. Anupunadi was here as well, who speaks about it. So, I mean, that's how we engage with it. Urmi has also worked on diasporic literatures, who's been, who's also here despite a lot of difficulties. I mean, one of the reasons that we're talking about so many people is because that's how we function at the center. We believe in these inclusions and uh, ways of looking at how inclusion works. And I think that's how 
the center works. I mean, it's 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 kind of ironical. I'm calling it the center at all points, but it's not really a, a center in that sense of the word. I mean, you're looking at uh, voices which come from all over, and I think we would like it to be that way. I think that and engaging with your voices help us to enrich our understanding of what it means to be the other. And you, you can't think of the other without looking at one's changing the gaze per se. So I'm glad that you've been here. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Devusi. Thank you, everybody, for being with us today. And we'll keep you informed about our next uh, session, whatever we are planning. We have a few plans. Yeah, and uh, we have the CCS has been page. Yes. We have the CCS page, which we can just share with you all in the chat box. So, so you know. Yeah. I am so chuffed and so delighted, yeah. Shucharita and Debushri, that you've connected me to a wonderful young scholar like Aparna. And it's always good to come back to my second home, my second Canada. Um, and thank you so much for including me all throughout. Thank you very much. Thank everybody. you. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. thank you. Bye for now. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.